Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to our session, Leveraging Culturally Responsive Practices in the Early Childhood Classroom Through the Counting Collections Routine. I am Dr. Melissa Hedges. I am the pre-kindergarten to grade five math curriculum specialist for Milwaukee Public Schools, and I am joined by my colleague, Danielle Robinson, Central Region Coach for Milwaukee Public Schools. For today's session, we have the following on our agenda. First, we'll provide an overview of our district, Milwaukee Public Schools. Then the feature of our session is actually our counting collections routine. We'll talk a little bit about why we have centered on this routine as central to our early childhood math work um, and what it is. And we'll also offer an overview of where we've been on this journey with counting collections, including a glimpse back into the past, where we are currently in this work and what our goals and aspirations are for the future. After that, we'll offer a brief closing. Milwaukee Public Schools is the largest school district in the state of Wisconsin. We boast 70,000 students with 156 schools. We have almost 14% English language learners in our district and almost 20% of our students qualify for special education. And we have a 75.2% economically disadvantaged student population. Over half of our district is black with a quarter, um, a little bit over a quarter of our district is Hispanic. And you can see um, the other ethnicities as, as shown on the pie diagram. And we are very proud of the diversity in our district. As we began to engage in this work around early childhood, as a team, we were reading the book, uh, Street Data by Safir and Duncan. The author's perspectives on data resonated with us as we reflected on a frame for the district initiatives in early childhood. And we settled on, as you can see, four different core beliefs that really anchor our thinking and our work with our teachers. So we believe that mathematics is humanizing, liberating, healing, and joyful. And the perspective of humanizing allows us to always place our children at the center of our work and place their thinking at the center of their work. As we consider liberating, we want our children to feel the freedom of being knowers and doers of mathematics as well as sense makers of mathematics. We want children to feel supported and cared for as they engage deeply in mathematical thinking. And finally, of course, we want our children to see themselves in the work and that they are, are eager and curious to engage in the mathematics that we are asking them to do with us. Enacting counting collections and supporting teachers with this work helps us realize our commitment to culturally responsive practices. We know that this work supports students' participation and their mathematical identities and agencies. We know that teachers are feel supported as they listen to and learn more about children's mathematical thinking. And we also know that this routine helps us enact our commitment to all aspects of equity. So what we'd like to do now is just take some time to really acquaint you to what are counting collections and what is this beautiful routine that we've really started to engage our teachers and our students in within Milwaukee Public Schools. So when we're thinking about what this routine is, is it is really about our students getting a collection of objects. So on the right hand side here, you can see one of our little K-4 students, he has a baggie of farm animals. And what his job is, is to count the objects and eventually be able to draw a picture and explain how he counted. And really what the goal is with counting collections is for them to determine how many are in the collections. As you can see, our collections can be several different types. We can have shells, we can have rocks, we can have pennies, we can have bugs or pattern blocks, really the, the opportunities for what can be a collection are, are pretty endless. We want to give you a little glimpse into what this can actually look like within a classroom. So we're going to take you into a K-5 classroom with Ms. Gordon and Mr. Harlan. And hopefully what you can see within this photo is students are spread around this classroom in different uh, spaces. Uh, they can be sitting on the carpet or sitting at their desk. And what you'll see is they're actually counting their collections with various tools. And what Ms. Gordon and Mr. Harlan are doing is they are walking throughout the classroom and are actually asking questions and really helping facilitate what the students are doing. But all of it is very much grounded in students thinking and how they want to count. Another way that this can happen within classrooms is also within a small group. So what we see here is we see a teacher um, from the Dream Project, Ms. Gaxiola, where she is working with her K-4 students, engaging in the counting collection routine instead within a small group. 
So depending on whatever teachers decide to do, regardless of the structure, if it's whole group or if it's within a small group, what is really beautiful about counting collections is that it is very intentional teaching. It is equitable. This is for each and every student and it is developmentally appropriate where teachers are scaffolding through asking questions, through using tools or providing through mini lessons. Another key way that counting collections is really grounded within developmentally appropriate practice is we are using the counting trajectory, the learning trajectories from Clements and Sarama. And so we know that there are three parts to a counting trajectory. The first part is the mathematical goal. And really what that helps us answer is where are we trying to go with our students? And within counting collections, we are really working on this big mathematical idea of counting and meaningful counting. The second piece of the counting trajectory is this developmental progression. So really helping us see where students are on this pathway of counting and really helping where they see where they've come from, where they are currently on that developmental progression and also where we want them to go. And the third part of the counting trajectory is this idea of these activities, these tasks, and questions. So really, how can we as teachers intentionally engage our students to really help them grow along this counting trajectory? And for us, the activity that we have chosen to engage in within our Milwaukee Public Schools is this routine that we call counting collections. So what we know is that children's thinking follows a natural development in their counting. And when we as teachers really deeply understand these paths, we can offer these activities that are based on student thinking and helps them progress. And so what we know is that inherently counting collections is developmentally appropriate and it's very effective. So we were able to take our learning from the, the counting trajectory from Clements and Sarama and we were lucky enough to have a teacher in Milwaukee Public Schools named Brittany DeWint who taught K4 at River West Elementary. And within her master's work, she took this trajectory and actually developed an assessment to really help her pinpoint exactly where students are along this trajectory. And that's what's really special to us is that the idea that this is very deeply homegrown within our district. Because once we know exactly where our students are on this trajectory, then we can really provide them with a just right collection to really help push them in their thinking and really develop these meaningful counting skills. So now we'll talk a little bit about why counting collections and why we chose to center this routine um, in our district work. As we set out to work with our teachers, we knew that we wanted to highlight the research of Duncan and colleagues from 2007, looking at the predictive powers of early mathematics. What they found out was in their longitudinal study, uh, they looked at um, a variety of early skills that could be predictors of students' later academic success. The two that, they, that we'll talk about today are early reading and early math skills. And so what the study discovered is that our early math, our early reading skills, we know are very strong predictors of our later reading achievement in our third and eighth graders. We know that early math skills are also strong predictors of later math achievement. The really interesting piece of the study that surfaced is that early math skills have stronger predictability for later reading achievement than early reading skills. When we talk about this particular slide with our teachers, we will always say that does not mean that you do not teach reading or literacy skills to your students, um, but that you really learn how to leverage the power of early mathematics in supporting children's learning. The other uh, study that we spent some time learning and uh, reading and learning about was from Wynn and colleagues uh, that helped us think about, well, if we know that early math is so predictive, what are the particular aspects of early math that really give us a good bang for our buck? And we've settled on the key competency of meaningful counting. In our professional development with our teachers, we spend a lot of time looking at the three counting principles that you now see on the screen. And the idea with counting collections is to intentionally engage our children in those counting principles at the level that is most appropriate for them. Through a big broad lens, we know that um, ordered sequence of counting numbers, the one-to-one -one principle, 
and the cardinality principle are what bring are kind of the full package of meaningful counting. In our work with counting collections, we've chosen to add in an, the fourth idea around organizing the count. Um, and so we know that for children to really be successful with their counting, um, it's important that they count each and every object and how they choose to do that is really up to them. So we really do spend some time featuring the idea of organizing the count. Um, as you, what you're looking at on the slide right now is what we call our counting goals. And those goals are um, they stem from the counting trajectory assessment that Danielle talked about a little bit earlier. Once we give that assessment, we're able to really identify where a child is in their counting and what their next steps might be. So if we take a look at Tristan, for example, during the counting trajectory assessment, he was able to verbal count to 27. We did notice that he struggled with a collection of 31, which is a task on our assessment, but he was successful counting into the 20s. Um, one of the things that we would do with him as a student is continue to watch his organization and then work on verbal count sequence. You see Kailani, Ariana, Joy, and King David all had similar comments as we worked our way through. So this is, for us, this is homegrown data. It comes directly from our counting trajectory assessment. It helps us be informed. It helps us maintain the intentionality of the routine, and it helps ensure that we are developmentally appropriate. The other part that um, was on the previous slide is you started to see some colors. So green, red, yellow, different levels. The levels on the previous slide talk about the levels on the trajectory. The colors actually bring us right back to our, what we like to call our custom counting collection kits. Uh, so we worked with um, Hand to Mind to help us develop kits that are leveled counting collection kits that um, ensure that each and every student has a has a collection that is at their best fit level. So it's not too hard, it's not too challenging, and it will continue to push on their counting skills. So currently we have three different kits, one for our three-year-old kindergartners, one for our four-year-old kindergartners, and one for our five-year-old kindergartners. In our three-year-old counting collection kits, our collections range from five items to 12, five items being in our smallest collections, which are red, our middle-sized collections are blue, and then our other collections are green. The neat thing about these is that in side of those bins when you take the lids off. There are about 12 to 14 different collections at each level and they're all color coded for um, easy organization for both teachers and students. As children move into four-year-old kindergarten, you can see the collections um, get bigger. We've kept the same colors, so red, blue, green, and yellow. And you can see that the, our 4K kits range from seven in our red collections all the way up to 40 in our yellow collections. And then for our K-5 students, we see our collections starting at 13 and going all the way up to 100. And some of our kits have actually um, collections of over 100. Again, those match the levels that we've identified on the counting trajectory that would be developmentally appropriate for children at those age levels to progress through. The other reason why we've chosen to do counting collections is we've discovered that the kids really love it. Um, we see our little one over on the left hand side talking about how fun it is. And one of the things that um, all of the children appreciate, and in particular, our five year old kindergarten students and our first grade students like it because they get to make it their own. They get to count how they want to count. Um, you can see in the middle one, this is a, a snapshot of a picture from a four year old classroom where the kids are actually counting the collection using the number path as a guide and then transferring how they've counted to paper in a representation to show how they counted. Um, in the upper right hand corner that's a first grade classroom where kids and teachers are kind of scattered all over the floor with a variety of tools as those collection collections get bigger, we've noticed that kids appreciate 10 frames as a way to help them organize. Um, and then in the picture in the lower right hand corner, we can see um, this little one is moving from counting by ones to really wanting to count by a group. 
we know that that idea of unitizing is a key mathematical marker for success. Um, this little one has decided they're not going to necessarily go to a standard unit of five or ten, but wanted to actually start organizing by fours. And so the recording papers become critically important to us as we monitor student growth and look for ways to push for improvement. The other piece that the other picture that I'll draw your attention to is the one in the middle. That is Danielle facilitating what we call a mini lesson at the beginning of our counting collections session. So we always like to provide a five to seven minute mini lesson that is organically grown from the work that the children are showing us in the classroom um, and as reasonable next steps um, to continue to push them in their counting. So what we'd like to do now is really just kind of take you through um, our journey and where we started with counting collections, where we currently are within our district and what our future plans hold, as well as some, some lessons that we've learned along the way. So when Dr. Hedges and I kind of began this journey in the 2021-2022 school year, um, really how we started was just identifying classrooms that were willing to try this. And so we started with about 20 pilot classrooms, ranging from about K-4 through first grade. And how we began is we really began by helping the teachers to assess their students using that counting trajectory assessment. The other piece is we took a very long time to make the kits. Um, we'll draw your attention to our, our some of our first collections that we made with some zoo animals as well as some sharks. Um, and then what we did is we were able to go into those classrooms weekly where we were able to facilitate these lessons with the classrooms with the teachers. And as time went on, teachers were able to begin to facilitate with us or even take on those counting collection lessons themselves. And then what we were able to do is actually complete post assessments to really see is this something that we want to continue to build capacity within our classrooms. And so what we found from our data is First of all, 100% of our students advanced on that counting trajectory, which it really was incredibly hopeful for us. Um, about 85% of our students in the classrooms within those 20 classrooms reached those grade level expectations on that trajectory. So for us, what that meant, if they were in K-4, we wanted them to be really working at a level nine. If they were in K-5, we wanted them to be working at a level 12. And if they were at grade one, we wanted them to be working at that level 15. So what we were able to learn from that pilot experience is number one, having these counting collections easily accessible was very, very important to our teachers and to their students. And really what we needed to help them do was really have this routine of counting collections in place so that we can really start to dive into some deep mathematical learning. We also wanted teachers to really understand how this can be a flexible routine. So they were able to realize I could do this whole group with my students, but perhaps I wanted to really do this small group. And so we've got teachers who do both. And really, that's the beauty of the routine is how flexible it, it truly can be. The other thing that we learned is that teachers really benefited and wanted side by side coaching. They wanted for us to be in there with them to really help them think through and be thought partners and thinking about how we can continue to help their students progress. We also know that this trajectory and this assessment deeply matter when we are thinking about being very intentional and informed of where our students are at. And it really lends itself to being developmentally appropriate. The other thing that we learned is that at times it can be really difficult for teachers to release that control, to really be able to feel secure in knowing that their students know this routine of counting collections enough to be able to take a bag of, of things and to go off and to count them. But what we found is once they were able to release that control, we found that students really began to flourish. So where we went next is, is really where we are now. So Dr. Hedges was able to secure some ESSER funds where we were actually able to purchase these custom counting kits from hand to mind for all K-3, all K-4, and all K-5 students. And you can see the picture of those boxes in our, in our room that we're housing at one of our high schools, the many, many kits that we were able to purchase. We were also able to add three early childhood math coaches to really help us build capacity within our district. We also were able to provide nine what we call getting started sessions where teachers are able to come, learn about the counting trajectory, learn about the assessment, learn about this routine. And we've had about 280 teachers who have come so far. Uh, we really started this in January of 2023, and we just had a couple of our last sessions last week. 
We also were able to um, send out some surveys and about 100 participants actually asked to receive follow-up support and coaching this past year. So what we're really excited about is to see the amount of teachers that are coming, the amount of teachers that are following up with us who just find a lot of excitement and joy in this routine with their students. There's a few other things that we have going on. Um, we also were able to implement uh, a, a, on what we called ongoing counting collection support, a PLC, where we had really a crew of about 30 teachers who would come and meet with us virtually every week. Um, and they were able to collaborate and really be thought partners with each other and to share their challenges and their successes. And we found that this was really vital in really helping them become independent in implementing counting collections within their classroom. We have a few projects that are occurring. Um, we really began this, this um, partnership with UWM and, and this Strong Start Early Math Leadership Project a few years ago, and we were able to re-implement it uh, within the past year. Where we began is we began with 15 participants in the summer of 2022, and we really believe because of this work of counting collections, there is this excitement and this hunger for learning around early math. And so we've been able to actually increase to 36 participants that we just had. You've got a couple pictures there where we were able to meet with them this summer. We finished our Summer Early Childhood Institute last week where we had 120 teachers who came uh, to learn and to talk with each other and just share where they're at in their journeys with counting collections. And we also are finding that teachers are so excited about this routine that they actually want it to be their SLO and their PPG in relation to the Danielson framework this upcoming school year and have been asking for support and really making sure that that happens. They really want to hold themselves accountable to their students. Uh, which we are really excited about. So we want to share with you our 2022-2023 data um, with all of our elementary schools that have been engaged in, engaged in this really for the full school year. So once again, we found that 100% of our students grew on the counting trajectory. We found that our K3 and K4 students, once again, about 81% of those students were able to meet those end of year goals. So we know that 80% of our K4 students are going to enter into K5 ready to really dive into that meaningful counting once again. One thing that we did we did see that we want to be very intentional about in, in really focusing on for the next school year is we saw that only about 44% of our K-5 students were able to meet those end of year goals. And so we're very cognizant of that and see that this is an area of growth for us and really thinking about how we can be deeply intentional in supporting those K-5 classrooms to really be providing quality counting collection experiences. So really our lessons that we learned after this past school year is number one, our teachers are our best advocate. The word of mouth has been phenomenal where we have teachers who are bringing their colleagues to come get excited about this thing called counting collections. We know that that ongoing support deeply matters to our teachers. They found it incredibly valuable to really help them begin to feel secure in their own practice. The other aspect of this that we are just continue to be excited about is the fact that this is a routine that is for each and every student. We had SPED teachers who were coming, we had self-contained teachers who were coming um, and really found that this was powerful for all of their students. We also were able to have some really meaningful cross-department connections with um, the SPED department. What I'll draw your attention to is at the very bottom, you'll see the cover of our counting collection social story um, that we were able to develop for, for all classrooms, but also perhaps for our students who, who need support in, in really solidifying this routine for them. We were able to meet with our new teacher mentors to make sure that we're getting our new teachers on board with this routine. We've been working with early childhood and we also were able to work with our arts, integra arts integration coaching team who really helped us come up with some really beautiful ways to create collections to actually bring home so that families can also engage in, in this counting with their students as well. So where we're headed, uh, really the plans that we are holding dear for our future here is number one, we're seeing a collective of, of early childhood teachers who 
want to be leaders in this work. And so we really want to formalize that and really continue to provide space for these educators to, to share and to teach others. We're also lucky enough to be adding grade one and grade two kits. We want to be able to uh, develop some, some really sustainable coaching cycles with our teachers who maybe are not feeling quite as secure or who are just new on their journey. And we also want to continue to bring together all of these different initiatives that we have going on within our district. Um, we've got Leading Math. We have our Strong Start group partnership with uh, our, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, as well as this really exciting work of, of really thinking about how we can mathematize literature in our early childhood classrooms. We want to continue to help teachers really take that ownership and being able to do their own assessments, to create their own counting goals, and to really uh, create their own mini lessons. And once again, just to help them see the intentionality behind the work that they're engaging with, with their, their students. And really our final goal is as we build capacity within our district, we want to figure out ways that we can actually make data accessible to us, but also to teachers so that we can continue to spread the word and, and share with stakeholders as well as um, as our, our district leadership to just see the excitement and, and the hope that is truly stemming from this work with our, our youngest learners. And with that, we just uh, deeply thank you for allowing us to be here and to collaborate with you all. Um, and please let us know if you have questions, please reach out. Um, but we just feel deeply lucky to be able to share our story with you today. So I saw a question in the chat really helping us start to think about how we would actually identify a student's working level. And the way that we would do that is we would move through this assessment. And if you take a look here, the assessment, I've got my mouse moving, the assessment is on the right hand side. And what we would actually have the teachers do is really move through these questions that are based off of each level um, to really help them determine what is that just right collection for them. And what's really useful unique about this is that um, let's say we have a student who is working at level nine, really what that means is that they are very secure in all of the previous levels and their working level is really where they're at, what they're working on when they're engaging in counting collections. Um, and we really have found that it's very asset-based and really very much about um, where a child is on this developmental progression rather than just about what they can and cannot not do. How do we go about identifying student working levels a little bit more thoroughly? Perhaps hop back to the slide on the assessment and talk through that a little bit maybe. And then we'll wait for other folks um, to see what questions you may have. You can, my understanding is you can just pop them right in the chat. So <laughs> is the slide you think the best? Um, I think, or go back one, let's go back to the actual, assessment. yeah, let's just take a look at that right there. Okay. So what you'll see, what you see on this slide, and Danielle, I'll invite you to interrupt at any point in time and add, is over on the left-hand side is our counting trajectory uh, that we've taken and adapted from Clements and Sarama. And we've uh, actually taken some liberties. Oh, thanks, Deanne. <laughs> um, we've taken the liberty to uh, kind of make it a bit more teacher friendly and started to think about uh, what what we would want, what, what a description, and then as well as an example of what this might sound like in practice. Because uh, we talk with early childhood teachers all the time, they really want to be developmentally appropriate. And until you really understand the developmental progression, in this case, counting, it's hard to be developmentally appropriate if you don't know what's come before and where kids are going with their skill and ability. So what we're able to to do then after we get teachers grounded in what a trajectory is and looking at a counting trajectory, then we take them through this assessment. Um, when teachers get good at it, it's usually about a three to four minute assessment. Um, and it's just very simple asking kids to count, um, asking them to count a collection of 10. If they're successful with counting a collection of 10, then it kind of bumps them to the end of our early trajectory assessment where they're counting a collection of 31. And to be quite honest, that actually gives us a plethora of data to kind of decide where they, where the, where they, what collection would be a good size for them to begin with. So I don't know, Danielle, if there's anything you'd like to add when, once we get that information. 
Mm -hmm. And and I think what's really special, and we can zoom a couple forward, is once we have that information and we know exactly um, where they're at with their counting and those four counting principles of knowing, you know, what is their verbal count sequence? Are they saying 29, 2010, 2011? We make note of those very interesting things. Um, we're able to make notes about their one-to-one -one, um, correspondence as well as their cardinality. And then from there, we're able to have I'm going to zoom forward a little bit here. We're able to ha actually have really robust learning goals for our students. Um, we've actually had teachers who use these in their report card comments. We've had them use that these goals during conferences. We've actually had our um, special ed teachers have used these for some of their progress monitoring that they've done with their students. And so even if you take a look at our little guy Tristan here at the top, he had a verbal count to 27. He did struggle a bit with a collection of 31, but was successful counting in the 20s. So we're going to continue to watch his organization and work on his verbal count sequence. So it really gives you a strong understanding of exactly where they are and where we want them to go. I think we saw a couple more in the chat, Melissa, if you want to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll respond to the one about, can you tell us more about how far you expect children to grow by the end of K-4 and K-5? So again, we anchor these, these types of decisions back to um, a developmental approach on how children grow and learn and their counting skill and ability, um, as well as what we've seen over the years of really just engaging with this project and then anchoring the work back to um, our standards. So by the end of four-year-old kindergarten, we would want um, our goal is that our four-year-olds are at a working level so they they are able to be successful but aren't quite yet secure at that level. So they're really working in that level. We would expect that they would be at a level nine, um, which is kids are able to count um, a collection of at least 10, though this is a, a very large level where collections span from 10 to over 30. So you can see there's a wide, wide range. Um, and then for our five-year-olds, we would expect them to be at a level 12, I believe it is, which is working within 100, counting meaningfully within 100 and starting to count by tens. And that matched up well with um, our one of our standards has children right at that level so um, and again we've noticed that with consistent practice and focus not only can children get to that level but over the last couple of years we've noticed that kids actually maintain those levels during the summer so we're not experiencing the summer slide as some folks like to refer to that as they really hold those levels as they come through so Danielle do you want to take the next one on special needs yeah sure so um, in what ways has this been helpful for students with special needs. I think the thing that has been, once again, really powerful about this routine is it's been a very inclusive routine and a routine that is truly for each and every student. Um, and um, I actually just came back from um, actually teaching a class for a couple of weeks. Um, and I had quite a few students who have special needs. Um, and what was really interesting about it was that um, even though one of my my students who is not quite talking yet, um, he even though could not verbally count for me, I was able to ask him, can you give me two of something? Can you give me three of something? Um, I was able to give him a collection. And what was really fascinating is to watch him to automatically go and start sorting. He had the zoo animals, so he put all of his hippos together. He put all of his giraffes together. He put um, all of his ostriches together. And so we're able to truly see the beginnings of this mathematical thinking, even though they may not yet be able to verbally communicate that, they can certainly start to show us their thinking as well. So we really truly value this as something that is for each and every child um, in our classrooms. So really, Great question, thank you. Um, and so to Beth's question, um, Danielle, are you okay putting up the very last slide with our contact information? If you'd like to reach out to learn a little bit more, um, please don't hesitate to email both of us. Um, oh, hi, Michelle. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, thank you. We're super excited about the work and very interested to see how 
how the routine will um, support in our first and second grade classrooms, because we know that that's where the place value work matters. Um, and we're just finding this is, uh, our first and second grade teachers are very, very excited to, to really get this work going. So um, I think with that said, I'll, let me take a look. I think we're probably close to time. So let's see. I think one question that just came to mind real quick before we go is um, yeah. really just thinking about um, advice that we might give to other large urban districts that might want mm -hmm. to to start this. Mm -hmm. And I think number one is find those people, build that capacity, find that group of teachers who will hop on with you because uh, they truly have been our biggest advocate of just letting us go in and try something and then the word has started to spread. Melissa, would you add anything? Yeah, I would say, I, and I see best question, what might, what advice might you give? And um, so I, I think start small. Um, again, if you remember from the beginning, we were in 20 classrooms seems like a lot, but I, <laughs> maybe it was at the time. Uh, so really start small and keep the focus on the developmental approach that's been really really helpful and then stay the course stay the course stay the course stay this course keep your messaging consistent um, and realize that um, teachers are really interested in this work and find it very very empowering so we've been very thoughtful around ensuring that they have um, as much say over the routine as as it as it makes sense for them in their classrooms. So different approaches. Um, Danielle always reminds us to go slow, to go fast, and that small is all. So start small, figure out what your mess main message is, and then uh, think about how you might go about gathering materials to do this, because that I think was a huge, <laughs> huge, huge piece for us. And then we really, really listened to our teachers. Um, when they wanted something different or they wanted a new resource, we were pretty responsive in getting that to them. So with that said, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we do, uh, again, my email is here. I see Danielle's email is not on there. Please reach out to me and I will get you connected to both of us. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions or concerns or even advice for us about how to keep the momentum going. <laughs> so thanks again, guys. Thank you so much.